Welcome everyone to a new podcast, a new international podcast, number 96, with Althazar Rositer. Now, before um, we start introducing the guest and um, um, continue with the podcast, I'm going to switch to uh, my native language, Dutch, to announce a Dutch event that we're hosting um, in the name of our podcast. So for the English and international fans, please fast forward for a minute or so. And uh, you will be back with us in English uh, in a little while. Voor de Nederlandse luisteraars, welkom dat je luistert. Gaaf dat je luistert. En we gaan het vandaag hebben over veel zaken, waaronder hoe kunnen we ons gelukkiger voelen. En daarvoor hebben we de grote eindbasisshow die komt op 27 mei. Een waanzinnig evenement op uh, het gebied van persoonlijk leiderschap. En ons thema dit keer is geluk. En um, als we dan vragen aan mensen van ja, uh, wat wil je nou eigenlijk in het leven? Zeggen mensen heel vaak, ja, ik wil gewoon gelukkig zijn. Um, daar is alleen wel een dingetje in. Daar heb je verschillende visies voor en verschillende methoden voor. En dat is ook voor iedereen verschillend. Dus het wordt heel erg belangrijk voor jezelf om daar zelf een weg in te gaan vinden. En daarom hebben we een evenement georganiseerd. De grote eindbaarsshow waarin we dit met vijf sprekers gaan bespreken. En een van die sprekers is uh, cabaretier en filosoof. Uh, En non-dualist Paul Smit. En hij zal zijn visie over geluk vertellen. En de non-dualisten die zeggen natuurlijk nogal makkelijk... Ja, geluk, dat is niet iets wat je kan creëren. Dat overkomt je gewoon. En als we dan kijken naar twee andere sprekers. uh, Twee biohackers. Dan hebben we het over Casper van der Meulen. De man die uh, het boek Mindlift heeft geschreven. En die graag in zijn zwembroek door uh, koude bergen heen loopt. Met zijn blote bast. En samen met Wim Hof. Um, en die zegt eigenlijk, ja maar je brein is gewoon een afstandsbediening voor je lichaam. Mijn vraag aan hem is dan ook, ja, um, er zit er dan ook een knopje op. Waarmee je uh, op geluk kan duwen. En daarnaast hebben we onze eigen Michel Vos. De presentator van Eindbazen. Wat ook natuurlijk gewoon een science geek is. En ik had hem net aan de telefoon omdat ik een promofilm aan het maken was voor dit evenement. Die zal ondertussen al wel online staan. En toen vroeg ik van jou, waar ga jij het over hebben? En toen zei hij, geluk is maakbaar en afdwingbaar, punt. Dus dat klinkt wel heel erg als Michel, die gaat het lekker daarover hebben. En ik ga jullie meenemen in mijn laatste avonturen die ik in januari bij mijn vrienden in de Indianenstam heb opgedaan. Ik ben nou weer tot veel toffe nieuwe inzichten gekomen bij mensen die gewoon helemaal niks hebben, die lekker in die jungle zitten. En ik heb daar weer onwijs veel mogen leren. En die lessen, die ga ik meenemen. En ik ga uh, mijn visie op uh, op geluk geven. Met uh, met die dingen die ik daar heb mogen meemaken. En de wijsheid die ik daar weer heb mogen leren. Dan als laatste hebben we de gast van vorige week. Die ook op het podium staat. Inzo van Zanten. En hij is de evangelist van Tony Chocolonius. Als je die podcast nog niet hebt geluisterd, doe dat zeker eventjes. En uh, als je die podcast luistert, dan begrijp je ook waarom hij bij ons op het podium komt te staan. En uh, hoe uh, chocola en geluk bij elkaar kunnen liggen. Of eigenlijk gewoon hoe chocola en geluk aan elkaar verbonden zijn. En op 26 april, dat is een donderdag, geef ik een lezing in de Bewustzijnsschool in Amsterdam. Over het vinden van je missie en het vinden van je passie. Als je nou zegt van ja, dat is allemaal leuk, maar ik weet helemaal niet wat het is of hoe dat het moet. Nou, juist dan moet je komen. Uh, ik geef daar een persoonlijk leiderschapstraining. En uh, dat wordt een hele gave avond. Uh, in een uurtje of twee neem ik je mee in hoe je uh, met handige tools en tips en tricks wat meer grip kan krijgen. Op uh, ja, wat vind je nou eigenlijk leuk? Wat wil je nou gaan doen? En op het moment dat je nu geen energie krijgt van je baan of van dingen die je doet. Ja, dan moet er wel iets gaan veranderen jongens. Want anders dan loop je vanzelf een keertje leeg. En uh, dat doen we heel snel en ik noem dat dan de moderne jungle. En wat we in deze avond gaan doen is, uh, je krijgt een lezing overleven in de moderne jungles. Daar ben je van harte welkom en ik uh, hoop jullie daar te zien. En uh, voor de luisteraars die uh, ons willen ondersteunen, doe dat alsjeblieft via nootrofit.nl N-O-O-T-R-O-F-I-T.nl Dat is onze... Webshop waar Michel en ik, ons bedrijf waar we samen uh, voedingssupplementen aanbieden. En vooral voedingssupplementen in de categorie Nootropica. Dat betekent dat zijn supplementen die je ondersteunen bij je cognitieve vaardigheden. Oftewel, beter denken, 
Je wordt er niet per se slimmer van. Maar het kan je wel helpen om woorden beter te vinden. Dat je een keertje een presentatie moet doen. Dat je bijvoorbeeld wat meer de woorden laat flowen. Dat je gedachten wat helderder zijn. Dat je meer creativiteit hebt. En dat je beter in die flow staat kan komen. Zodat je gewoon uh, getting shit done meer kan toepassen. Dat is eigenlijk waarom we dat bedrijf hebben opgezet. Jongens, um, ik ga nu weer eventjes naar Engels. Ga ik uh, Altazar introduceren. En dan gaan we verder met, uh, met deze podcast. So, thank you everybody for... Uh, <laughs> thank you international guest. If you, uh, if you actually stayed listening to, the, to this Dutch language. Which is pretty, uh, pretty weird to hear probably for you. But we are going to introduce our next guest. And his name is Altazar Rositer. He is a spiritual teacher of many people here in the Netherlands. Uh, We actually got a hold of him via uh, a previous guest, Robert Bridgman. Robert, if you listen to this, thank you for bringing us in contact. Um, And Robert is the representative of Althazar here in the Netherlands. They do many workshops, uh, many lectures about, um, well, the spiritual path and how to heal yourself. Um, and I actually read um, Althusser's book called Spiritual Intelligence, and it's really um, a simple, explained way how spiritual practice can be implemented in daily life. So I had a lot of questions about it, and well, I'm going to ask you guys the same questions. What do you guys think about karma? Is uh, does it exist? Is it something, or what is it in your opinion? And is it, how can it affect us? Or does it affect us? Or how about the term collective consciousness? Do we actually carry the pain of our elders, of our parents, or maybe generations before? And what can we do with it? Um, it was really uh, nice to discuss with uh, Althazar uh, when we recorded this podcast. I just got back from the jungle in uh, the Amazon where I stayed with my Indian friends. And um, we talked about uh, the rites of passage that I went through and uh, what his vision is on that. Uh, it was really cool to, um, yeah, to talk with... Uh, with Althazar, he's a special person, Um, he has a special energy around him, Uh, very peaceful, very gentle, and uh, yeah, it was really, uh, uh, I had a good time talking with him, sometimes it was confronting, (laughs) we talked about it afterwards, Uh, he was asking the right questions to me, to to make me think uh, about the deeper things here in life, Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, and uh, we will probably see him back in the podcast in the future. For now, uh, I'm going to leave it with you guys. Uh, Here you have two hours of Althazar Rositer. Enjoy. This podcast is sponsored by Nutrofit, official distributor of Onnit supplements in the Benelux and powerful supplier of bulletproof and natural stacks. Your online place to buy supplements and training gear that will help you achieve total human optimization. Try with no risk with our Nutrofit money back guarantee. Shipping all across Europe within 24 hours. Find us at www.nutrofit.com. My backdrop. Yeah, they can be good. What have I got? You Nothing. got Superman and uh, <laughs> uh, what's the other one? Captain America, Batman, and uh, uh, Batman and Spider Man. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and a plant. Yeah. Spider Man's good. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite superhero? Um, oh, I don't know that I have one. I would. Um, I'm a Star Wars fan. I'm a, I'm a Jedi. You're a Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, like uh, a lot of superheroes um, have a very spiritual um, background, yeah. right? Or motivation. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not really sure. I think when I was younger, I looked up to Bat- Batman because um, it was kind of a loner, you know? And it resonated a lot with me. I'm a loner too. I can be mm-hmm. in my house. Well, you know, this is a thing, like nobody actually saw me and Batman at the same time, so. Yeah, so who knows? Yeah, who knows, you know. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. it's uh, it's funny to see because um, um, these superheroes, they bring something up in our um, 
in our in our psyche and in mm -hmm. our in our body like um yeah. I don't know something um how would you explain it do you know what I'm meaning like uh, we can we can connect to them in some kind of way well I think you know they they embody a lot of principles um, one that I noticed with uh, Spider-Man in particular, uh, I remember a couple of lines in the Spider-Man film, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm. And, and, and it does, but we all have great power. So really, we've all got to take responsibility for the power that we have rather than, you know, coast around the world in victim mode, uh, waiting for somebody to save us. We're all yeah. our own superhero. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I noticed comes up so often, and especially it, it did come up in Spider-Man, was uh, there is no uh, attachment allowed to, you know, a kind of a dominant, precious other person. Mm -hmm. it, it's just not allowed. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, and the reason is those people can be targeted as ways of coercing the you know the hero to do something or stop doing the good that they're doing so to do something that they shouldn't be doing or to uh, or to stop interfering with the dark mm. um, and you know that goes right back through the uh, you know the Inquisition and the Renaissance you know where witches and uh, healers were persecuted yeah but they were persecuted by attacking their families, yeah. you know. So if you don't stop doing this stuff, we're going to hurt your family. We're not going to hurt you. Yeah. We're going to hurt your family. Same. The Nazis did it too. Wow. You know, it's it's that energy, and so that's why it becomes, or it has been necessary for superheroes to remain a bit under ah. the radar. Yeah, I like it. It's deep. We had a, um, recently we had a Dutch <clears throat> um, professor in um, the history of drugs in the Netherlands, but also in general in, all, in the whole world. And he uh, told a funny story that the first encounters with LSD, uh, because it's a fungus that um, can stick to the, the meal from some kind of bread as uh -huh. well. And uh, I think it comes from a mushroom. Well, a, fu a mushroom is a fungus. Yeah. So the, the fungus would get on the, uh, on the bread. People would eat the bread and start seeing stuff. They would get in these altered states. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're in the 1600s and people are seeing colors and uh, smelling colors and, and you know, seeing sounds and stuff and they, they, you, you speak it out loud, yeah, you probably get on the... Um, the work on, of the on, devil. Yeah, the work of the devil, yeah. You get crucified or, uh, or yeah. worse. You know. uh, we've been through some time, so... Um, for people who don't know, we're talking about with um, about superheroes and all this. Um, your name is Altazar Rositer. That's correct. And um, you, well, you're an interesting cat. I just told you already. <laughs> you do a lot uh, because I saw you as a uh, in, with a history where you worked in a corporate environment in mm -hmm. oil business. Yes. And uh, for some reason, you're now transformed in um, in a spiritual coach, spiritual mentor, well, teacher. It's not quite as Black and white is that. Mm. Um, I trained as an electrical engineer, and so that's the work that I've done um, for many years uh, because it's paid me very well and enabled me to establish myself uh, as a human being in a kind of reasonably comfortable existence. Mm. Where I worked was mostly in the oil and gas industry, designing power systems for... Um, oil installations offshore and uh, and, and land-based, you know. So, it's, so even you know, recently, I, I still do some freelance engineering work because oh. it's uh, it's useful. But there's a there's a story there. If mm. um, you know, I took about ten years out mm -hmm. uh, to explore myself. To uh, I, I went and did a. A training course i did a what we call uh, a bachelor's degree in england mm. uh, and then i did a phd mm. a, in uh, psychoanalysis and linguistics um as part of my own search for uh something different because yeah i actually wrote it in my notes what, what is linguistics like language yeah linguistics is language but it's really 
the the linguistic part for me was not like learning many languages. It's like how does language work? Mm-hmm. How do we operate with language? Where does it come from? And uh, there's a whole load of uh, philosophy goes with it. It's like we're turning thoughts into words, yeah. you know, and. Um, one of the things that I do in the work that I do now is um, I get people to speak uh, their intent. And the reason I do that is because thoughts are are kind of, they're somewhere abstract. Nobody knows where they are. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it hasn't been proved that they sit in the brain somewhere. Uh, We know the brain processes thoughts, or seems to anyway, um, but we don't know where thought is. And there are concepts that say well thought is a kind of field it's an energy field but it's not actually in this physical dimension Mm -hmm. whereas sound is sound is physical it's a pressure wave you know so when you speak you are bringing thoughts from one dimension into another dimension Mm -hmm. and also when you use your voice you are actually using your breath because your breath powers it and your breath carries your life force so speaking aloud has actually a lot of power Mm -hmm. Um, you know we have certainly in in England uh, a concept that words have power and if words have power where does that power come from well it's got to come from you yeah yeah the spoken word is something that uh, people underestimate I guess Mm. Um, I experienced it myself um when you feel uh, um, bad for yourself or you're talking like, mm. oh, I feel so bad today. And if you mm. even, if you acknowledge it by speaking, it makes you probably even feel worse. It can, yeah, yeah because you affirm it. Mm-hmm. You give it energy. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big difference between, because um, uh, I, I started recently talking to a girl who, who said, who did it a lot. She, she said she was talking a lot of, she was expressing her feelings, mm-hmm. but expressing your feelings is something different than being negative, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, again, you know that's that's something that you need to uh, te- te- tease out. I think uh, we need to express our feelings, um, but sometimes we don't know what our feelings are. Mm. So, getting that expression out is a bit messy, um, and most of us are not used to it yeah so what happens is um i i talk about this often like a uh, you, you know there's some kind of medieval castle with an old plumbing system and you know down in the dungeons there's a there's a tap you know and you turn the tap on and it goes shakes and bangs and rattles and suddenly there's a gush of dust and dead spiders and a load of rubbish Mm. and then some water trickles out and it's brown and it's mucky and black and horrible and gradually it runs clean and that's how learning to express our feelings and our emotions has to be approached because um, mostly it just comes out as a as a rant, you know, as yeah. a, it comes out with a lot of force and a lot of negativity, uh, because it's just been built up inside us for so long, and we've not been allowed to express our feelings. Mm-hmm. Our cultures don't allow it, mm-hmm. um, so all the mess has to come out first. Yeah, and then when we've done that, then the feelings can be expressed cleanly, without actually projecting any guilt or shame or blame onto anybody else you know it can be this is how i feel and it's just how you feel it's just yeah. clean and uh genuine yeah interesting we're gonna have to back go go back go back to the part where you were um telling what you were studying oh and finish oh, right. the story who you are and what you do <laughs> <laughs> and i'll stop interrupting okay so yeah well so where did i get to i got to uh linguistics is mm-hmm. about for me is about how language works mm-hmm. and so it's how we're turning our internal world mm-hmm. into our external world and you know all the uh, cultural rules and the you know all the wrinkles that, that that carries so it carries an energy of 
you know, our ancestors, all, all the culture, all do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs that we pick up as we as we grow into mm -hmm. uh, the people that we become. And that all gets imprinted through language. Powerful, yeah. You know, um, and we get programmed through language. Um, again, you know, I, I don't know what your school system is like here in the Netherlands, but in England, when I grew up, we used to have religious instruction. It was part of the, yeah. the national curriculum. Yeah. And we were taught to sing hymns. And one of those hymns had the, had the words, I vow to thee my country. Mm -hmm. You know, and we would sing that to the uh, the music of um, one of uh, Gustav Holst's pieces. Uh, I think it was uh, Jupiter, the uh, in the planets, and you know. So that's a very strong, you know, powerful melody. I don't I don't know if you know it, um, and it's kind of being anchored into our system through the vibration of the music mm -hmm. and through our own voices, you know, and it's like we're being taught to surrender everything to this national body that really has nothing to do with who we are. Yeah, it's not you. It's not you, no, <laughs> but it's where we exist and when mm -hmm. it's where we, where we live and where we learn to be uh, human in a way that we can survive. Mm. So what was the transition from you as a linguistic to, um, to where you are now? Um, well, that's a good question. I, um, it was part of my journey. And, and what happened was, you know, I was working as an electrical engineer and fed up with it and uh, nothing was working. My life stopped working. Um, and so I was looking, you know, how can I do something different? Um, my first marriage broke up. And the reason I went to uh, back to college as a mature student was uh, I just didn't know what to do with myself. And I had a 14-year-old son who decided he wanted to live with me and not with his mother. So mm. I thought, well, I need to be around. What can I do to amuse myself? Where might there be a few women? And I went and did an English degree because there's always a few women reading English. Yeah, go back to school, man. That's the thing. <laughs> go back to college. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's the kind of uh, low-level motivation that I had. Um, mm. But, of course, there are always unforeseen consequences. And I started to uh, learn about myself. I started to learn about psychoanalysis. And, you know, and, of course, that's very bound up with with language and what we associate with experience and how we express it. Mm. And um, so that kind of took me into myself and that took me onto my PhD, which was again looking into myself. And I was thinking, well, maybe I can uh, move into academia and become some kind of university lecturer. And I would need a PhD to do that. So, so I did that. But by the time I got to there, um, I realized that that was just another rat race and another loop. Mm. And uh, I needed to do something else. So uh, I started to explore metaphysics. Um, and it, it was really a kind of reawakening. I'd been meditating for a number of years. Yeah, yeah th this is again, you know, it's, it's part of my story and we're jumping about a little bit. But when, um, when my marriage ended... Um, I'd also uh, gone to a, I found, found an evening class which was about stress and burnout and mm -hmm. I learned to do uh, some meditation. Uh, what I learned was a Buddhist meditation called Metta Bhavana and I still practice that and that's kind of over 30 years that I've been doing that off and on. I won't mm -hmm. pretend that I'm a, a regular meditator um, but it has served me very, very well. Mm -hmm. and. My sense of it now is that that really uh, empowered my awakening, but in stages. And it, you know, it like it wasn't like a, a sudden spiritual uh, epiphany. It was just letting me yeah. unfold myself to myself, step by step. And you know, because I was 
very stuck in my head and very mental. Uh, I went down mental roads, you know, to, I thought, well, you know, this is the, you know, we live in a mental world, you know, people take notice of uh, people that have got qualifications and, you know, PhDs, they're, they're the experts. I'll go and be one of those, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and I found that that didn't actually uh, speak to me and I needed to go deeper into myself. And once I started to <clears throat> reconnect with metaphysical things, and, and I say reconnect because uh, that's another part of my story, um, things began to shift in a different way and I found that uh, my own system responded energetically in ways that uh, I couldn't make any sense of you know mm -hmm. so I call it energetically uh, because I could feel it and it you know felt like you know various uh, sensations in my body they'd be hot cold uh, tingly and you know strange uh, and the only way I could make sense of it was that it was some kind of spiritual energy or metaphysical energy um, manifesting in me and through me and um, Mm -hmm. and waking me up um, and the uh, the story of my awakening is that um, I have been doing the Buddhist meditation for a number of years and I met a lady who uh, introduced me to something called healing healing mass and she was a Catholic and uh, something, she had some interest in, uh, you know, in spiritual growth and healing. And she said, there's a priest coming. And I immediately, you know, did <laughs> shut down. Started singing the song you were doing on that. On the, on the, on the and and he, she said, you know, he, he does healing. He does healing in the church. Mm. And I thought, oh, how am I going to get out of this? Um, and she said, why don't you come? And I thought, well, all right, I can go. Um, I can always get up and leave if I don't, if I'm, you know, don't have any resonance with this. And um, so I went and I got really quite a big shock um, because this priest, he is a Monsignor, I can mention his name, Monsignor Michael Buckley. He, I don't know if he still lives, because um, this is a few years ago and he was quite a, an old man then. Um, he said Mass in the church. I'd never been to a Catholic Mass. And, you know, so there were a lot of people that knew the drill. You know, they knew when to get on their knees and when to stand up and all the mm. rest of it. And I thought, I don't know this, but I'm not going to pretend. So I sat there and I did my Buddhist meditation. Uh, what I didn't realize was that he was going to go around the church blessing everybody mm -hmm. and it was going to take three hours. So I was in meditation for three hours. <laughs> I, got, I got my blessing as well. Wow. And in that time, my whole energy system just switched on. Like I was cooking, really cooking, hot, pain in my hands and... It, I was, you know, uh, the technical term is shit scared, you know, and mm. but also uh, it was quite an awakening. And there was a part of me going, wow, this is really great. I need to stay with this and find out more about it. And another part going, oh, no, because <laughs> um, it was like there was some kind of soul memory of it. And it was like. Oh no, not this again! You know? <laughs> <laughs> the song got deeply integrated in your DNA. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, I did uh, explore it obviously because I'm doing mm. that kind of work now. Um, but I didn't go straight back to the church because I had a problem with uh, religion um, again mm. from my childhood, and I'd rejected religion completely. Um, so. With that, I'd rejected spirituality because mm -hmm. um, I bundled it all together. Um, but as I started to do the, you know, more of the meditation, I was getting open to spirituality, but again, keeping it separate from the sense of any religious dogma. And uh, and I still do that. 
Um, and uh, at a later date, the uh, that I did see that priest again, and he did, even though I'm not a uh, baptized Catholic or mm -hmm. confirmed Catholic in any way, he anointed me for healing, which is was something quite special. He did what? He, he anointed me, you know, blessed me and put uh -huh. his robes around me uh -huh. and blessed my hands uh -huh. for healing uh -huh. to because he recognized that the, there was some kind of energy working with me as a healer. Mm. Yeah, it's strange to think about, uh, while you're telling the story about a priest, uh, I never really thought of uh, a priest in a Catholic way as a healer. Mm -hmm. you know? But still, he's the leader of a, of a spiritual movement. Mm -hmm. And um, they're singing, which is similar as chanting or making yeah. vibrations. And there's a lot of intention and prayers in it. So, yeah, now you, yeah, when I think about it, priests are a good priest, should be a, he yeah. is a healer. Yeah. Exactly. Um, of course, what I've learned is that, you know, there's, there's good and bad. You know, there's not, you know, there's not a one size fits all. And there are plenty of people in religious life who are, are really good people doing good work. Uh, and there are the other kind. Yeah. It's funny about it. If you're talking about a priest, I have a, a funny story. I just come back from the jungle. I've been baptized in, a, in an Indian tribe. Mm -hmm. And uh, they brought in priests from other villages. Like right. from, uh, you have different villages and a few important guys who are spiritual... Uh, um, uh, um, how do you say it? Like on, on a high spiritual level, and mm -hmm. they bring them in for special yeah. occasions, including this priest. And so this priest did the baptize, and and these people they uh, they have a lot of plant medicines they use, including yes. they call it cheru, which is just cannabis. Yes. And um, we did the baptizing, and and after, um, after I think a few days before I left, everybody was sitting in a circle in the evening, and we're just they were smoking their cheru, which is a, which is mm -hmm. a common thing, and. Uh, I don't know. I think somebody from the outside learned them how to make a bong, you know, with, with water. Oh, right, and, okay. uh, <laughs> so they made a bong from a Coca-Cola bottle and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a water bottle. And the priest, who was such a well-respected man for everybody, and mm -hmm. everybody was like, oh, yeah, 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 he's the priest. And he was like literally everybody uh, saying to everyone, like, you, you, now it's your turn. You got to take the bong. You got to take the bong. And he was yeah. doing it to everyone. And he had a little help who was making the bong. And I was just observing it. I was like, there's a priest who's making everybody high as fuck here. <laughs> everybody was having a good time. And at the end, I had three hits of the bong and he was telling a whole story to me and my, my brain just got confused. I didn't know. I was not in the moment anymore. It was a really funny moment. But um, um, I saw his work during the baptism uh, with chanting, with mm -hmm. him. Uh, doing work. It wasn't, it wasn't, the baptism was four days of... Um, of yeah, hard, hard work. The first day was about getting people to a physical border where they, um, uh, where you get exhausted to this mm -hmm. threshold. Yeah. And afterwards, uh, they would put you in in a, in a hammock, and then you had to lay straight for twenty four hours. With the idea that if you, if you uh, were laying sideways or whatever, that would be the rest of it. That would be the way you would go through life, the rest of your life. So. For 24 hours, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you have to lay straight. And uh, the little children, they came uh, chanting um, and they would um, wiggle the, um, yeah, the station, hammock. Yeah. So there was, you were not allowed to sleep and they were keeping you awake. And like the little children, the girls from 6 to 12 years, years old, they were chanting for about 8 to 12 hours. And then behind us, there was a big fire and there were the priests and his team, they were chanting... I think they were just chanting three or four different lines and they did it for eight to 12 hours straight. And at one point I thought my head exploded. Yes. And uh, it was a great reminder that um, for me, for myself, that I, to be in all honesty, I underestimated it because I've been to the jungle before and did a pretty uh, intense plant diet, which was with, a, you know, with plants and mm -hmm. stuff. So it's more, it was more of a physical thing. It was a long time. And now I went back and I was like, oh, this is only a four-day event. This is going to be a holiday. <laughs> and uh, man, I underestimated it. Yep. It was such a um, revelation to me that um, 
they were really building up some kind of energy field. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was seeing geometric patterns, and my head kind of exploded. Your mind wants to go everywhere because you want to get out of the hammock mm -hmm. and blah blah blah. Um, what, what do you recognize in this um, in this kind of rite of passage um, with this, uh, you know? Um, getting people to the point of exhaustion and building up the energy where, where transformation occurs. Okay. Is this something familiar to you? No, it isn't. I don't have experience of that. You know, I hear st stories uh, like yours and um, and I did a uh, retreat a few years ago with uh, a Sufi who did that kind of thing. You know, mm. uh, he insisted on... Uh, uh, fasting and uh, a particular uh, plant-based diet and he kept everybody dancing you know yeah. and moving mm -hmm. um you know f four five hours at a time um exhausting them and i i think the value in that is that it keeps you in your body and it just empties your mind your your mind is then uh a receiver because in the everyday sense uh, and I'm just reflecting on this now mm -hmm. you know in the everyday sense our minds are just full of what's going on in the environment you know we tune into what you know what I learned to call the matrix you know there's this cultural matrix uh, and you go into a big city and it's just full of the the vibe of everybody and it's been it's basically all their busyness all their fear all all the stuff that they think they've got to get on with uh, all their imperatives you know that i must do this i must do that uh, i must catch this train i must you know they're all the musts all the shoulds and the mind is just full of that and it's just full of all that program of how i've got to get from here to there and i've got to survive mm. and i've got to produce money and when you do that kind of thing that you're talking about and um, what I've just said I did with the Sufi um, your mind gets exhausted because you and you just you just in a get in a place of surrender and then you can hear your inner wisdom mm. in, in another way but you can't hear it at other times and it might be like oh I've had enough of this uh, you know yeah. uh, I need to go and lay down or I need to, you know, just go out and get some fresh air. Um, but it's a matter of learning that you can hear yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say in those, in those situations often, um, decide for yourself what you actually want to do, whether you want to stay there, whether you want to go, whether you want to be in this situation. And generally we do want to stay with it, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes we don't, but you, it puts you in that place of choice, which is a place of empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, a ritual for, uh, a rite of passage from a young man to mm. a grown man, adult man. <clears throat> and although, um, you know, for me, the way it was always plant medicines like the ayahuasca and, mm -hmm. and uh, had very good results with it. And uh, my body resonates with it because otherwise I wouldn't do it every time. Um, but this was just, uh, I came back and I felt very uh, grounded, very, uh, mm -hmm. uh, stable. And during a few ayahuasca sessions there, I, um, I experienced well, during the first, ex uh, session, I experienced a complete helplessness and uh, a fear as a child that we carry with us, mm -hmm. which is something that I had to pur purge. Um, and it was definitely, uh, well, you know, once you're there, everything kind of connects and there's no coincidence in uh, mm -hmm. why you're there. And, uh, and after coming back, I feel there's a more, uh, more, uh, there's more certainty, uh, more decisive. I am more decisive, mm -hmm. I guess. And, um, yeah, more stable, more grounded. Uh, so it was a good choice to go there. Mm. Um, I do think that um, our society doesn't acknowledge uh, the rites of passages enough these days. Uh, to be, in my opinion, I think our society softens so much that you know there, there needs to be a uh, 
a point where we can actually acknowledge to this little boy that he's grown up or that he, he's done something where he can go on to the next phase in his life. Uh, sometimes I feel in our community that, uh, that we kind of forgot these rituals or uh, um, these spiritual teachings because I think it's a spiritual um, diploma that you actually uh, should get. Is that something mm -hmm. that you agree on? I've n never really thought about it. Um, I think there is a, uh, again, there's a whole mess of the way we treat children mm. um, in certainly where I come from. Uh, they are kind of insulated from the world. Mm. Um, you know, when I went to school, um, you know, I would walk myself to school. I would, you know, make a nuisance of myself with my friends and, uh, you know, generally enjoy the freedom of being out on my own. Uh, now children are kind of uh, taken to school in, you know, by their parents in cars, you know, the the school run in England, it chokes up all the roads, you know, it's, it's yeah. well known. Um, and I think there is a great fear around children uh, learning about the world and, and growing yeah. up um, and wanting to protect them and overprotect them. Um, as for the, the rite of passage, the acknowledgement of, you know, when someone has actually grown into an adult and when they haven't, again, that's a, that's a very grey area. You know, mm. uh, we don't have it very much in, in Western society these days. Um, I've never thought about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, well, maybe there is no good or bad in it. I mean... Um I think a rite of passage, for me, one of uh, maybe, it's not like an official rite of passage, but for me it was, uh, for example, when I started traveling on my own for the first time when I was 22 years old, uh, I went to Australia for a year and I traveled f all over the world. And um, a lot of people told me like, you, you, you went away as a, as, a, as a young boy and you came back as a man because mm -hmm. you... Uh, yeah, you encountered some fears, uh, you handled loneliness, yep. and these are parts that, uh, yeah, we just talked about. Yes. Um, people get, uh, children especially, get protected for yeah. in a way that I think is unhealthy. Yeah, I think too. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so you, you did have a rite of passage. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. And there are, you know, there are many people that do that. You mm -hmm. know, um, I think it's become far more popular. Uh, for young people to do that, you know, when they reach that kind of, um, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, uh, maybe they've been to university or maybe before yeah. they go to university, they take this time out yeah. and go traveling and they get away from mum and dad. And it's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mum and dad can be helpful, but at one point yeah. <laughs> in your life, you need to take a distance. Um, and so I think that's very healthy. Um, uh, I grew up in a time when that wasn't, uh, was, was neither available to me, um, nor was it common. And um, so, you know, my rite of passage was, was a bit different and mm. uh, messy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Going back to your experience in the church afterwards, mm -hmm. what happened? How did it unfold? Oh, well, how that unfolded was uh, I kind of didn't tell anybody for two or three days. I kind of just sat with it uh, because the, you know, the kind of energy in my body stayed with me for about three days. And I, I could find that I could just close my eyes and I could reinduce that kind mm. of uh, energy and I can still do it of course um, and the the lady that I went with uh, who became my partner for a few years um, she suggested that I go and explore uh, the whole idea of spiritual healing so I did and I went to uh, some uh, meditation healing groups in London they were uh, run by what we have in England called the uh, National Federation of Spiritual Healers. And I learned, there I learned about uh, the energy in your body and about chakras and balancing the energy field and mm. 
you know, giving somebody a, a, a session where you, you know, you wouldn't work, you know, you wouldn't work hands on, but you'd be working through their aura and through their energy field. And I learned that I could feel that and I could do that. Yeah. Um, and, and then it unfolded beyond that. I, um, I learned about Reiki uh, and Reiki has become very popular uh, it's almost um, uh, almost mainstream these days mm-hmm. um, I but I learned about Reiki in I think about 93 and I became what's called a Reiki master in 95 um, and then I kind of shared Reiki with a number of other teachers so I got <clears throat> several initiations as a Reiki master uh, and I taught Reiki for several years myself for four years uh, thinking that that was you know that was my way forward in life mm-hmm. um, but it was simply another step you know to unfolding and opening and uh, and then we move into the time when I wasn't doing any engineering I'd taken time off and uh, I was finishing my PhD and um, I'd become a new age tourist you know, anything that was wacky, um, you know, hugging trees, uh, talking to extra, extraterrestrials, uh, angels, uh, you know, energy healing of any kind, mm-hmm. you know, I would sign up for it. And uh, and all of that has informed me now. You know, I don't uh, recommend that everyone does the same as I've done. Um but it's good to explore, and it's a bit like you know you, you write a passage when you you know you went travelling f- mm-hmm. for a year. Um, I, I did quite a bit of travelling, and I did um, you know lots of different courses and workshops, and uh, and found out uh, about energy, um, about how I function with energy, uh, and I found out some things to avoid. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, what I teach people now is, you know, uh, as much to to find their own way with their own energy. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't get any lessons in school about it. Um, uh, we don't get any indication of the power that we hold um, and the responsibility that goes with it. Mm-hmm. So I have your book here for mm. listeners who are watching. This is the book. It's called um, Spirituelle Intelligentie in Dutch. And Developing Spiritual Intelligence in English, right? That's, That's the, correct. Uh, yep. yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting. So this is basically, is this the work of your PhD? No. No. So, but this is the, um, I was looking into it. <clears throat> I was like, well, if I'm going to do all this, it's going to hurt a lot. <laughs> We're going to have to go through some processes. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the story of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, the book is it, it's interesting. Uh, the English version uh, came about because um, I think probably about, oh, where are we now? I, I lose track of the time. Um, some years ago, my, my English book was published in 20, 20 Six two thousand and six, um, but I think probably two or three years before that, maybe three years before that, um, somebody from the Netherlands found me in the UK. I was giving a workshop at a conference, and uh, she just said to me, "Can you come and teach us to do this in Holland?" Mm-hmm. And I said, "Well, we'll give it a shot." You see, so. Uh, she set up a uh, a course, you know, uh, it's a lady called Charlotte Corbet mm-hmm. and she's a good friend and I stay with her whenever I come, or generally whenever I come to the Netherlands. And she had a, a, <clears throat> a foundation called um, Shapers of Education and it produced uh, workshops and conferences here I- in the Netherlands for new paradigms in education. And... Um, so she set this course up and we, we had a two-year program um, where we did uh, four retreats each year. So it was eight retreats. Uh, they were residential. And for each one, I wrote course notes. Mm-hmm. And the course notes became the book in English. Oh, okay. And then she tried to sell it to 
Dutch publishers, and they weren't interested. Mm -hmm. it, so the time obviously wasn't right. Yeah. And then, you know, a few years later, I met uh, Robert Bridgman, uh, Robert Jan Bruchemann, and he uh, had been to my workshops, and uh, he was, you know, very interested in the work that I was doing. And he said, you know, can you come back and do some more? And yeah. then he took the, the book to uh, the Dutch publisher, the same publisher who rejected it before. Uh -huh. And they said, oh, yes, we, we'd like this. And so, yeah. and so cool. here it is. Cool. Yeah, it's a very interesting book. I uh, made some notes about it. So, um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> first of all, it's called Spiritual Intelligence. Uh, which is for most of our listeners. Um, Robert actually talked about it when he was here in the podcast. Okay. So, uh, but I like you, um, uh, your, your view on it. What is spiritual intelligence? Um, well, I think it's um, it's an organic wisdom that uh, inhabits all of us, and it uh, it actually doesn't need developing. Although I, my English book is called Developing It, it mm -hmm. doesn't need developing. It's there. What we need to do is to wake up to it. Uh, and develop ourselves so that we can embody it and embrace it. Um, but it's it's like the, an organic wisdom that inhabits all of us. It's it tunes us in to the uh, the universe. You know, I'm a Star Wars fan. It's the Force, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, and that connects us all, and it connects us all in a way that supports life. And when we align with it, our lives flow. And sometimes it gets a bit difficult to align with it. And that's just because we're getting in the way. Because that intelligence, when we open up to it, mm -hmm. it pushes out everything that's in its way. And, you know, I, I, I do this in front of the camera now because I think what happens is we open up to our spiritual intelligence, our soul intelligence, our higher selves or whatever it is. And it goes, hmm, there's not much room in here. And it starts going, oh, oh, and it pushes out all of our old patterns and programs, all the stuff that keeps us small mm -hmm. and stops us from expanding and uh, following uh, the path of our heart. Mm -hmm. Interesting. My Indian friends call it the Yushibu. Yushibu is the creator of everything, of all mm. water, earth, animals, spirits. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So <clears throat> um, for the people who are listening to it and like, well, it's kind of vague. Um, when do we know when we are in contact with this spiritual uh, intelligence, even if we're not spiritually uh, developed or, uh, or we, we don't have the wisdom or the knowledge, are there common situations in daily life where people can uh, recognize, like, hey, this is this connection? Um, I think common situations in daily life tend to disconnect rather than uh, connect. Mm. Um, and it's really a matter of taking time out of daily life to connect. And, you know, one of the things I teach people to do is very simply you know to to put your hand put you know like open your body maybe put both feet on the floor put your hands together so that your fingers touch and it closes the meridians you know mm -hmm. the the energy circuits in the body and just breathe bring your energy you know bring your attention to your breath and breathe and when you breathe in you breathe you imagine that you draw your entire energy field whether you think you've got one or not you pretend you've got one and draw it all inside your skin and just do that two, three, four times. And then you're connecting with yourself and you can maybe see a different aspect of life. And it's mm -hmm. like when, when you've separated from the humdrum, from the mainstream humdrum of everything that's going on, then you're in a place where you can be connecting with your spiritual intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, your book is about, and you're also your own um, uh, journey is about, uh, I heard you talking about developing your sensitivity. Yes. Getting aware of what's going on, of your energy. Um, I've, been be, I've been doing this a lot myself in the last few years, uh, but I was wondering, is there a physio, physiologically, do I say it right? Physiology? Physi physio 
Uh, I have Dutch and uh, English notes here. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. together, yeah. this is what happens. Yeah. Well, we, <laughs> but is there a physiological um, difference in, in, in humans um, that makes us different in developing these, uh, this sensitivity? Is it, a, is it a, a blueprint that's for everyone the same? Or does it diverse per person? For example, my girlfriend, she's so sensitive that I, I, I'm, I don't really know if I will ever get there to that point. Um, I don't know if I want to either. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, we, we get into the, the realm of sensitivity mm -hmm. and I think human beings are more sensitive than they realize most people, mm -hmm. particularly men. Um, and we're taught to shut it down. Yeah. Um, so it's not like we're not sensitive. It's just we've switched it off. Mm -hmm. uh, and sensitivity is both a, a gift and a, a curse in some ways. You know, um, you know, m my you can you can cut out the stop. <laughs> um, I, I'm just kind of thinking how to explain this. Um, what what I see is that the only place that men are allowed to cry is at a football match, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our culture. Otherwise, you know, if, you, if you show any feeling and emotion and shed a few tears, you're a wimp. Mm -hmm. Or if you just think about that a little bit, you know, if you've got the courage to show your feelings and show your emotions as a man and shed a few tears, maybe in public, then that takes a bit of courage, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know? I have a hard time crying as well. Yeah. Um, for some reason, uh, I have a lot of talks uh, with my girl about it. She, uh, when she's emotional, she cries and, and then it's over. Yeah. And when I get emotional, it gets stuck in the body and I'm, you know, wandering around for a day with it. And, uh, yep. I, and there really needs to happen a big thing in order for me to, uh, to make me cry or yep. let it go. Yeah. I, I had to learn to cry again, um, you know, in my mid thirties, um, and it, you know, I, it's easy now. I don't have a problem with it. You know, I, mm. if I'm uh, even if I'm leading a workshop, if something pops up that you know touches me, uh, I'll shed a few tears. You know, the teacher is crying. So what? You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, what I think about sensitivity is it, it, it again is another huge subject, and. If you know when you walk into a room whether people have been fighting or not, you're sensitive. Yeah. If you mm. if you're walking around town, maybe you know somewhere that's not very savoury, and you find yourself on a street that feels hostile, you know it feels hostile. Yeah. You're sensitive. Yeah. You know, um, and it's a matter of learning to trust that and learning to open up to it because that's your inner guidance system. Yeah, it's the best explanation that I give to people. And uh, I have moments where I opened up a lot. <clears throat> For me, it was through, through uh, uh, plant medicines uh, where a new kind of world opened up for feelings. And, um, and that's the best way to explain it. Like if somebody walks into a room and you know he's angry, you feel it. Mm. And the whole room feels it. Exactly. And that's just it, you know? That's just it. Uh, yeah. There's no other way to um, to explain it. Uh, what I do f uh, thought was really um, um, interesting to read in your book, you um, refer to uh, um, Rupert Sheldrake, Robert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake, um, do he, I? Uh, Rupert Sheldrake, that's his name. And um, yeah. He's uh, in the same, uh, working in the same field as you are, and he has a, um, it's called morphic renaissance. Yeah, and he calls it morphogenetic field, isn't it? Or morphogenic field, I think yeah, he calls it. I yeah. actually know him from a podcast in, uh, with Joe Rogan in the US where he was talking about doing tests with people standing behind each other. Uh, one person would think of a, um, like 10 questions, and he mm -hmm. was thinking of the answers, and the other, the other person had to answer it themselves yes right. or no or one or two and what he found out was that um, if you concentrate on the other person's 
uh, mind. Like, mm-hmm. what, what are you thinking? I, I'm not sure if I explain it the right way. But basically, what he, uh, he found out was that every test, uh, people would uh, give the same answer without communicating with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he called that like uh, an energy field where, mm-hmm. which, which connects our thoughts. So the par- he's basically he's making paranormal activity scientifically yeah. proven. Yeah. yeah, I haven't followed his work uh, very much. Um, you know, I know about it and mm-hmm. I know he's working in the field and I know, um, you know, what I've seen of his uh, his talks and uh, what I've read. Um, you know, he's, he's very much working in this area and seeking to bring it into a mainstream yeah. acceptance in mainstream reality um, and of course the uh, you know the establishment uh, resists it very strongly mm. um, uh, as far as um, what we feel what we recognise in uh, in energy and sensitivity what I think happens is um one of the ways I explain it, it's like we're all, you know how, what a mobile phone does, you know, a, a cell phone. Mm. It, you know, it broadcasts into the ether, it broadcasts, you know, it yeah. sends and, and it brings, you know, messages back. There's a, there's a frequency, there's a carrier. Yeah. Well, we're all a bit like that. Only we broadcast our feelings. Yeah. That's, that's what imprints our energy field. Our feelings go out. So that's why, you know, when you walk into a hostile area in town, you can feel it because all those feelings are there. You know, when you walk through, uh, I, well, I, what I remember once, I remember being on the uh, on the tube, the London Underground, mm-hmm. um, a few years ago, shortly after the uh, the bombing on the, uh-huh. uh, that happened in, I think it was, uh, when was that, 2012 maybe? Uh, Oh, 20, oh, 2007. Anyway, when it, whenever it was, it was 2000, 2007, I think. Uh, but I remember being on the tube and the tube stopped. The train stopped in the tunnel and everybody was just, you know, sat there looking around at each other. And, and the fear, you could you could almost cut it. Mm-hmm. Um, and... That energy is being broadcast. It's being, you know, put into the the field, into the matrix. And what happens is, any time that you get a bit scared, you will resonate with the with the field, and so that that fear comes through you, and it will make you more more afraid, perhaps, yeah. than you were to begin with. It kind of amplifiers your your fear and, and it keeps you kind of in that fear modality mm-hmm. so, so this is where my question comes from uh, do I want to be that sensitive so if I start developing my sensitivity and I will mm. go to the tube that feeling uh, what will get into my body will even become worse I will mm-hmm. become more aware of it yeah. does that help me is it helpful for me well what's helpful is to be aware mm. Um, and to be aware that this is happening around you and that there might be people that are not aware of it. But when you're aware of it and you are aware of your own place in it, then you can choose what you do. You don't react. So it is useful because once you've got a sense of how you're operating and how all that energy functions in you, you are then at a place of choice, so you're empowered. Uh So, yes, it is useful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and you don't want to take it's. It's like if if you're kind of saying, "Oh, this is this got horrible," you know, I got a bad feeling about this, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and and you and you're just stuck with a bad feeling. You're still in victim mode. Yeah. But if you learn to manage your sensitivity, you're empowered. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, that's where we get to the uh, the, the power of awareness and. Um, I see here, I made a note of, um, um, it starts with the power of intention, like I want to change this. Yes. Um, so your book is about, um, uh, there are different methods in it, how to, to heal yourself. For example, when I get to this fear, this fear of uh, losing a loved one or 
um, being left alone and mm -hmm. I, I, I'm aware of it. What, what is the, uh, is there the uh, healing blueprint for that, according to you? What is, or, well, there is, but what is your, uh, your <laughs> what is your blueprint on that? Or is it too, uh, too easy to say? Oh, well, be specific. Um, well, for example, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to, uh, I have a feeling in my body where I'm afraid to, uh, to be, for, um, it's hard to say. Like when people are in a relationship, for example, mm -hmm. they think, um, they are, they, they get a feeling of fear of being left alone. Mm-hmm. But is that the real thing that's underneath that? It could be. Well, but, um, okay. Again, I think you've got to uh, look at how we do relationships. It's not mm -hmm. about, you know, it's not a simple thing of, you know, fear of loss. It's about how we do relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what we, the way we do it is, you know, we feel love and we project all that onto the person that mm -hmm. we're with mm -hmm. and we think without that person we can't feel love mm -hmm. but in fact that's not it that person just enables us to feel the flow of of our own energy uh, which is like bliss mm -hmm. that's that's how that's who we are um it, and that person enables us to open up to it yeah but it's not about that person mm -hmm. And, but we put it all on that person. Mm -hmm. And then because this is such a great feeling and we, you know, and we want to be in that space and we projected that onto somebody else, then we're then afraid of losing that person because we think we, you know, because we're going to lose that connection with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, and what we have to do is uneducate ourselves or deprogram ourselves from projecting that neediness onto another person. Yeah. So that's the, the so-called victim mode, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's also called codependency, you know, because it, yeah. then, then it becomes, you know, a relationship becomes, well, I'll be nice to you if you're nice to me. Yeah. You know, and if you're not nice to me, you can't love me. Conditional. Yeah. yeah. You know, and in fact, um, you know, I, I'm in a wonderful relationship myself uh, with a wonderful partner very conscious and you know we've been together 20 years um and it's a soul relationship but it's not a love and light relationship it's very much uh you know love and light but it's not it's not the traditional you know it's not the the new age all blissed out all the time no it because there is so much love love pushes out anything i'm waving at the camera <laughs> love pushes out anything that's not of itself you know so anything that's in the way of love gets shown up in its light you know it comes up as the shadow mm -hmm. and so that means my partner forces me to be the best version of myself yeah and i do the same with her and when she throws a load of shit at me, mm -hmm. I have to recognize it as that and not take it personally and hold the space. And vice versa, you know, she has to do that because, you know, I'm not perfect either. Uh, you know, I have my moments and I want to blame and I want to point my finger. Yeah. And she has to say, this is your stuff, sort it out. Yeah. And it's not that she doesn't love me, she loves me enough to tell me this yeah. and I know this and it's not a personal thing it's not about the connection between us it's a it's because the connection between us has pushed it out yeah yeah that's interesting yeah I feel if you uh, if you met your um, your twin soul or uh, well somebody we really uh, care of and usually I guess the older we get um, the better our filter is for who is a, who is a better partner for us um, that's debatable. Yeah, is it? <laughs> well, I think there are lots of people who are still making uh, uh, disastrous emotional yeah. decisions, yeah. even when they're when they're older. You know? Yeah, I agree. They're stepping into the same partner and in the same because until they deal with their patterns uh -huh. and their programs, they will continue to repeat that, and they'll expect the 
uh, you know, they expect yeah. their needs to be met in a way that kind of supports their dysfunction. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, let me just rephrase that and say that I talk out of my own experience where I feel this is the way it is right now in my mm. relationship. And uh, sometimes it's, it's a mirror that <laughs> yes. is really, it is, you know, it's never been bigger and uh, it's so confronting for myself, mm -hmm. especially. And uh, yeah, if I look back on the last uh, last few years and all the progress, then uh, it's a blessing to uh, to be aware of it mm. and to have a partner to be uh, that is aware of that as it, well. It's mm. fantastic, you know. But many people don't understand that, and they don't understand why, you know, you can you can make love in the morning and have a really blissful experience and connection together, and then. You know, 12 hours later in the evening, you're fighting. Yeah. And the reason you're fighting is because you've just brought through all that good energy mm -hmm. and it's going, have a look at this. You mm -hmm. need you need to sort this stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this projecting to other people, uh, this is, um, where, where does this come from? Is this uh, the ego that develops when we're young and trying to protect it? And that it's not our fault? Uh, we, um, or um, where does it come from? Society thing? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. Um, you know, there are there are no straight answers to any of your questions. Yeah. Uh, um, it, you know, I don't do too much of the science, um, but the uh, there's a, there's a certain level of survival stuff that goes on, and you know. We, we as we develop, we look at what we need to survive us, to you know, to stay alive and to to keep functioning in the world. And we project. This is all about projecting our power outside of ourselves, um, because as children, we are powerless or. Pretty much, you know, we're totally dependent on our parents, mm. you know, initially totally dependent on the mother, uh, totally dependent when we're in utero, in the womb, when the mother's pregnant, because, you know, we're, we're, our bodies are completely nourished. And then, you know, when we're, when we're born, again, you know, we're out in the world, but we are completely helpless and we are dependent. So the power is outside us and we internalize that as we don't have the power. Mm. And, and because that gets kind of programmed in very early before the the frontal cortex is developed, because the frontal cortex doesn't actually develop until about uh, 12, 13 years old in, it, in human beings. Uh, you know, we don't have any way of rationalizing that and understanding, but that stuff gets loaded in to our memories and, and early programming, and we stay with that almost all our lives until we find a way out of it. Yeah. So, you know, we are we are projecting our power outside ourselves. And if we come back, I'm just going to come back to um, the language thing, you know. Um, a very easy way of looking at this is when you read something, you know, we often say, ah, oh, it says here, you know. Well, the book or the newspaper or whatever, doesn't say a thing. You say it. Mm. So you're projecting your power into that material, that text, whatever it is, that's, you say, it's, telling you, it's, it's intrinsic in our culture and in the language we speak. Yeah, it's not our own inner truth, but it's yeah. someone's truth. Yeah. yeah, and we say, it says here, oh, what does that notice say? It doesn't say a thing. Mm hmm yeah so this way you have to get to the part of uh, um, recognizing mm. right which is a big part of your book as well to um, that's where the healing starts yes yeah it all starts with you because it's all about you mm. what's the first path of recognizing like for example if I uh, um, you're talking about negative thoughts changing thoughts is mm -hmm. a, after recognizing you should start changing thoughts is one of the, the, the main things. And then that's something that I um, um, encounter some problems with, with sometimes. Like when something negative happens mm -hmm. and sometimes it's too easy to say like, oh, you just have to change your mind. It's such an easy thing to well, say. Well, you know, you can't do that. 
um, it's you know it's the old the uh, thing, you know, if someone tells you to stop thinking about something, you can't stop thinking about it. You've got to think of something different. Because uh-huh. that, that's the way the mind works. You know, you, you'd, um, the mind doesn't work on uh, kind of negative instructions. It doesn't work on uh, negations, you know. So it's like you, if you say something, you know, stop doing that, you know, like, uh, you, know, stop, you know, stop scratching your nose. Uh, you know, that thought is of the paradigm scratching your nose. The, the stop bit doesn't actually register in the mind. It's like the mind has to think of something else. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, we had this thing, you know, stop thinking about, stop, no, you know, just stop thinking about elephants. Stop it, yeah. you know. And as soon as someone gives you that suggestion, you can't stop thinking about elephants until someone says, well, okay, think about feathers. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> you know? Then you can think about feathers and the elephants have gone. Yeah. Um, so, come back a little bit. Careful with the mic. Um, the way I approach it is you cannot solve any issue, any problem, at the level of consciousness that it was created. And that's the problem with the mind. Mm. So until you step out of that level of consciousness, then you're stuck with the old patterns. So changing the thought patterns isn't going to work. You know, because, you know, you're trying to fix something that's broken with itself. Yeah. And it can't be done. Yeah. And that's where we get to spiritual intelligence. And that's where I get to with, you know, I've, there are some uh, protocols for uh, working with that, and th- that's what I often, well, it's what I do teach. I do teach people, uh, but I teach people to to make them up and to to invite spiritual intelligence, invite your soul, your your higher intelligence, divine intelligence, whatever words work for you, mm-hmm. um, to invite that to bypass your mind and. Uh, and change whatever needs to be changing. Yeah. Um, so, so is it necessary to um, uh, to, uh, to help? To, to, need, to you need help with that? Do you need other people to um, uh, to help you with these? Well, I think it, again, you know, it's you, it, you don't need anybody else. You can mm. do it yourself, yeah. but it helps. You know, it helps if you're in an energy field or an environment where uh, other people are exploring yeah. the same kind of thing, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you know that you know that creates a, a kind of microcosm where you can be uh, experimental yeah. and try it out. And, and again, you know, that's something that I uh, try to provide in in my workshops—a yeah. a place where we have this uh, motto: "Dare to be wrong." You know, take a chance. You know, explore, experiment. Yeah, it's very interesting to um, to explore these different layers of spiritual intelligence. Like, I know very well when doing plant medicines. Like, ah, this is the realm where I am right now. It's very familiar. Mm-hmm. Then I was doing a retreat in uh, in America, um, which was all about breathing and dynamic meditation. Dynamic meditation is. Um, Founded by uh, an Indian mystic Osho, where he um, where he, there are, he has different uh, dynamic meditations where you actually move a lot. Mm-hmm. Like his, his vision on this is like we're we are not we're humans and we need to we're not made to sit be to sit still. Mm-hmm. So uh, you um, um, charge the body with doing the breath work for yep. 10 minutes, and then you release all the anger, the shouting, the screaming, mm-hmm. whatever comes out, and that's one of the dynamic meditations. And one of them is where you just, um, um, like when you do a warm up with sports, where you um, um, put your knees up, mm-hmm. you do it for 15 minutes. And after that, you get to a point of exhaustion, you don't want to go anymore. And after that, you can sit down and just sit still. And mm-hmm. and that awareness, um, it was really interesting to me to do that. Like I was sitting in the in that awareness and thinking like, hey, I've been here before. This is This feels very familiar. Mm-hmm. And... 
you know, you have these insights because you know, you're there, you're connected. And um, although it was familiar, I think it is one of the thousand layers you can get into. Um, it's a very wide variety of, mm -hmm. of the spiritual intelligence. Do you get to do you get to a place daily where you where you are at that place that you recognize? Yeah, yeah. that's just yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a short answer, but it, but yes, um, and it's just because I'm practiced and uh, uh, you know I'm used to doing it. I, yeah. you know, and I have my own practices for doing it, but they're not physical. They're um, you know, they're, they're internally referenced. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I daily, uh, invite spiritual intelligence, my spiritual intelligence, my divine, I am intelligence to inform me, to, mm -hmm. to be with me, to, uh, infuse me with dove, uh, and also to inform me with wisdom. Um, now, when I'm not in that space, I can't guarantee, I, I can't even guarantee that I'm going to be wise all the time anyway. But if I'm kind of talking from what I think I know, and this, and I use that term advisedly, it's what I think I know because that's from my mind, um, then often I will be kind of stuck with what I've learned, uh, knowledge. If I, if I connect with uh, divine intelligence, uh, I will say things that I didn't know I knew. It was, and it would be, oh, well, of course I knew that, you know, like I'll be doing the internal thing. Oh, well, of course I knew that, but I didn't know I was gonna say that. And I didn't know it would fit here, mm. but it's kind of, somehow it comes through. And so, you know, my process, is my practice is to invite divine intelligence to <clears throat> to infuse me with mm. my love, to inform me with divine wisdom every day, um, and to be with me in all places where I need it. Um, I'm, I'm waving at the camera a little bit because I'm going to just say we have what's often called free will here, mm. and this is another pet idea of mine, um, not entirely mine, because I think we have free won't. And what I mean by that is free will is the freedom to operate entirely from what we think and what we know at the level of consciousness that is mainstream, everyday um, reality. Okay. And we also have the freedom to invite spiritual intelligence to work with us. Mm -hmm. But that's the freedom, you know. Um, and what that means is spiritual intelligence, spirit, divine intelligence, uh, angelic guides, whatever you want, however you want to connect with that kind of realm, they cannot intervene until you give them permission. That's the free won't. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, no, I can do it all myself. Um, we make an awful lot of mess. And most of the people that I come into contact with that have found a spiritual path of some kind, it's because they've made a mess of things and it's hurt so much that they've either wanted to jump off the roof or make some really deep change in the way they live. And, you know, I often say, you know, spirit is just sitting there going, when's he going to ask? Yeah, <laughs> when's yeah, he going to yeah. ask? Oh. And, then, and then when you do, when you kind of say, okay, spirit, or you kind of connect with whatever is in your heart and you go, I need some help, it goes, at last yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it comes through with a bang and often that's that's quite dramatic yeah, yeah yeah i recognize i have problems i have difficulties asking for help yeah it's a pride thing you don't want to bother other people yeah yeah that's, 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 that's you know. how it manifests yes yeah that's where burnouts come from yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah interesting um so <clears throat> Um, help me out here. I'm just uh, looking at my notes here. Um, 
There's also one thing that I uh, thought was very interesting and it probably has also to do with this. We t- talked about it a, l- a little bit already, the collective pain, mm-hmm. which is, um, um, well, I'll let you explain what the collective pain is, but how do we recognize collective pain separately from our own pain? Or is collective pain our pain? Um, well, I think it's both. You know, uh, we we contribute to collective pain, mm-hmm. and we uh, and we feel it. But often, uh, if we're carrying some of it, we need to clear it in ourselves. And when we clear it in ourselves, we can recognise the collective as they're in pain, mm-hmm. and I'm not part of that. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't recognize it so um, for example um, there is still in Europe a lot of pain from the Second World War yeah you know um, those people who are still around that experienced it don't like to talk about it it was so awful Mm -hmm. and that's collective pain And some of that gets passed down because, uh, you know, the effects of that pain and that trauma will have conditioned the way those people parented their children. Yeah. So it gets transcended by not talking. So it's, it's, it's kind of distanced from it, but it's still there. Yeah. You know, uh, and so those that kind of pain is in the collective. And, um, you know, when you see uh, pictures of, uh, you know, Second World War or, you know, maybe uh, pictures of the uh, the concentration camps, you know, you, you kind of feel the horror and, the, you know, well, that's part of the pain. And it's not like you're ever going to look at it and say, oh, well, you know, that's okay, because it, it wasn't okay, but you you're going to be in a place where you're not reacting to mm. it and then you can hold space for somebody else who is and say, and help them to kind of just feel what they're feeling and uh, get clear of it in themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think we talked halfway the podcast about uh, clearing their stuff. Um, uh, interesting to... Um, so we're in daily life. And we look at the picture and we feel this pain. How to handle? What's the step um, to instantly do something with it? Well, if you recognize it, you know, the first thing is, you know, uh, recognize it. And uh, the the step that I do is I immediately, uh, you know, if I'm in that kind of situation, I say, okay, divine intelligence. And I will, I will kind of say this, divine intelligence. I feel whatever it is that I'm feeling. I want you to uh, infuse this feeling with divine love, release it and show me where it comes from. Mm. And uh, so I've invited divine intelligence to to work at whatever level that I can't see with my conscious, you know, human awareness. And then uh, I might get some clarity but it's like there, there's practice. This is like building a muscle that you've never used. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can imagine that for a lot of listeners standing in the kitchen arguing about stuff that yeah, this is a weird thing to do. To, yes, uh, it is. To yeah. speak out loud and sure. to something that is probably not there in their... Um, yeah, and it's... Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, if, if you want to get to the front of the queue at the supermarket, do it at the checkout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can still be burned at a stake <laughs> in some cases. Yeah, I understand. And that's that's one of the many ways, obviously. That's one of the many ways. Uh, and you get used to, uh, once you start to understand how you're being affected, you can, you can put it on the back burner mm-hmm. until you are ready or in a place where you can deal with it and you but you can notice that you're reacting and, and then, you know, certainly if you're in a, a situation where you're arguing with somebody, you can you can stop the argument dead. You can just stop arguing and say, "Okay, the, I don't I I don't want to talk about this anymore." They might upset them because they still want to keep going, yeah. and you just say, "That's enough. It's going nowhere. I 
I'm not going to talk about this anymore and just leave it. Uh, and, you know, those, if you're in a, a, an argument, you know, people will want to keep going with that argument because what they want to do is they want to prove themselves right. And that when they prove themselves right, they've taken your energy because, you know, you've kind of gone on, you know, and yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. Yeah. And so they've taken your energy. And when you walk away from it, uh, they're left, you know, still wanting your energy and, you know, maybe even get more angry. Don't walk away from me. Don't ignore me. And it's like, you know, where's this going? Yeah. Where's this going? It's going nowhere, you know? So, um, the, the tip for the day that, uh, you asked me to give, you know, um, it's a really interesting thing just to, if you can, with, if you've got enough presence of mind, just to internally go, I bless you with love. Bless your enemies. Yeah. yeah. I bless you with love. <laughs> um, and just do that internally and and it changes things mm. well that's you have to try it I can tell you a story if you like mm -hmm. well we um, still have uh, 20 minutes okay well I, I, I tell this story um, in in uh, my classes and to anyone that will listen <laughs> um, many years ago when I was first uh becoming aware and waking up to myself. Uh, somebody gave me Louise Hay's book, You Can Heal Your Life. And I read it and thought what a load of rubbish it was. Um, and it wasn't even written very well because I was uh, a literatist, a student of literature and I knew about good writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I thought, well, you know, let's, let's see if it works. And I tried it out. I was working in central London in a street where many people will know called Tottenham Court Road, which is a main shopping street in uh, in central London. And I got off the tube one morning uh, and I was walking up from the station and, you know, about maybe 50 metres ahead of me, I could see somebody that I didn't like. It was somebody, a colleague in the office who didn't like me And I didn't like him right back, and that was just how it was. You know, that was that was fine. Could live with that. And we were, I knew I was going to catch him up because I walked fast and he didn't. Um, so I slowed down and I caught him just at the entrance door of the office block. And it was one of those doors that had an automatic close on it. And so he pushed it open and let it fly back at me. And I just thought, mm, that's... That's what I expected, you know. And we had to go through several doors like this to get to our workplace. And each time, you know, he would walk through and just let it swing back at me. And I thought, hmm, well, let's just try this. I'll send him some love. I, I couldn't feel it, but I, all right, I send you some love. And he held the next door open for me. Mm. And it was a, it was like, you know, someone could have just gone and and knocked me over. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, people should try this, to feel them for themselves and see and, for themselves. And let's face it, you've got nothing to lose. What have you got to lose by trying it? Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Well, it's a better uh, way of looking at somebody than uh, at least to try to give it a shot. You know. Yeah. Um, you don't like the you don't like the person for for your internal reasons. Yeah. Maybe you look like somebody who, uh, who bullied you at school or mm -hmm. whatever. You know, you have so many projections and emotions and emotional scars that you know, we label people. Sure. Um, 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 another thing that I think is really interesting and uh, is um, karma. Mm -hmm. What is karma and um, <laughs> what is the function of it? <laughs> How do we cope with it? Um, what do you think is karma? Mm. Karma. Well, first question is, do you believe in karma? Um, that's a question that everybody should uh, define for themselves. Um, I think it's debatable in, uh, in different ways. What I believe and what I saw from my um, vision quests uh, in the jungle is that um, as a soul, you have an opportunity to, uh, to choose a life with lessons. 
So you're up there and there's a thousand possibilities what kind of life you're going to choose right now. Um, and you choose it and uh, you go through life with that. You have a certain uh, challenge to uh, to find here, maybe a mission or um, yeah, things you can take back to grow as a soul and uh, to transcend to something higher. That is my... Uh, perspective of uh, how we yeah i think we, ch we choose a life and i do think that the people we meet and the situations that we get into uh, there's not much choice in it i do think we have a choice it's whether would you like a coffee or tea that kind of stuff mm -hmm. it's, it's more smaller but uh you know um yeah your path your path has already been uh, decided you can you can fight it against it and it's going to be a really hard path that's so the, that's that's, that's the, the making the connection with that yeah, spiritual and, and that's the free won't you can fight it you, you that's the free won't that's yeah it. yeah yeah you can fight it. <laughs> so uh you can struggle against it and i think that is the um, um that's where growth comes from mm. yeah well, uh, yeah so uh, well, anyway, well, that's my point of uh, and do or karma. Mm, um, I think karma uh, comes from the Buddhist religion, right? Um, I think it, it's uh, Hindu. Hindu, yeah. So um, I'm, to be really honest, I'm not really. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not really into it. I didn't really look into it, and I and I see karma as a thing. Uh, it doesn't come to my mind very often. No. Well, I, I think, you know, the uh, the popular uh, interpretation of karma or, the, you know, the general interpretation is that uh, there's some kind of debt that you've got to repay because you were a bad person mm -hmm. in another lifetime and so you've got to be a good person or make it up in some way in yeah. this lifetime. And uh, I don't like that interpretation. Um, I don't know if it's right or not but I don't like it yeah. uh, and I rather like the uh, the interpretation that you just expressed where you know we it's what we take on as a soul and we take on we, something that needs to be cleaned up and uh, and and that's our karma that's a kind of uh, and we we may take it on because we we have uh, explored the dark side and the light, the light side in other lifetimes. Who knows what's happened? Mm. Um, but we know that there is a job to do and something to be learned and some service to be made. And we and so we come in and we take on, um, you know, difficult situations in life, and uh, and so there's there's karma in that. But there's also karma in the sense that. We're all connected. Um, there is absolutely no doubt for me that you and I uh, and you know everybody in the everybody in the world is connected, and we're connected with the universe. We're connected with all living things, with with nature, um, and <clears throat> in some ways, you can say there is really only one being in the universe. And we are all part of it. And so if I do harm to any other being, I'm doing harm to myself. Mm. And that's karma. So, you know, there's, there's that. So why do I want to do harm to myself? Well, I don't, do I? So I do my best to yeah. do no harm to others. Uh, because, you know, it comes back to me through... Uh, maybe a long loop of energy, you know, a long kind of feedback loop, but it comes back. Yeah. And yeah. so there's the cause and effect. Yeah. So you have a choice to instantly work on your karma. Yeah. And of course, uh, and sometimes, you know, something, you know, it quite funny happens, you know, uh, you, <clears throat> you have a, a thought or uh, something that you're not very proud of and you kind of do something that's going to, upset somebody uh, and immediately you you know somebody upsets you or you know and it's like well that happened quick yeah <laughs> you know? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I remember uh, a funny story again you know I was <clears throat> again some some time ago I was in a, in a uh, kind of cafe restaurant where uh, there was a 
a bench seat, you know, not seats like this, but a, just a bench, you mm -hmm. know. And, and I didn't notice that I was on the end of the bench. And, uh, and I was making fun of somebody across the room. And, uh, and, I, and I stood up and I, when I sat down, I sat down <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> and it was like yeah. instant karma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that goes. And especially when you realize it at that moment, yeah. you feel extra stupid, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have two questions for you left. One is them, I really broke my brain on, um, on a certain phrase called consensus reality. Oh yeah, well it's good to- um, Help me out here. To, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad your brain was broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, consensus reality is mainstream reality that everybody subscribes to it's like uh, it's when <clears throat> it's what people call natural and it's it's what they do in their everyday lives you know this is the reality that we live in you know the reality that um you know uh, there are uh, bad people there are you know you have to go to work for a living you have to work hard you have to you know mm -hmm. all those kind of cultural ideals that we are signed up to without knowing you know when we're very young uh, all, all the stuff the religious dogma the stuff that you've got from school that is of no use to you uh, that's all part of consensus reality and yeah. we then kind of live in that thinking that we can't do anything about it mm. that's consensus reality yeah yeah, yeah. so that's uh, our traditional and cultural yeah. familiar uh, fam the fam family imprints yeah. everything that yeah we, and it and it's a consensus because we all agree mm -hmm. that that's how it is yeah yeah there's a lot of uh, we need a lot of change in perception to um, to yeah. work on that. Mm. that well, that's a, that's a part of your you talk about the new paradigm, right? The new mm -hmm. world, and one of the words is uh, authenticity that came in there. And I truly believe with internet being more transparent, um, like there's no at one point the internet will be so transparent. For example, I was talking with my co-host Michelle about this. In a few years, there will be video. Uh, software where people will put this video in and they will see our you know, body, body language uh, whether we are lying or not mm -hmm. you know so this this transparency with internet and everything gets online and uh, authenticity really is the is the only way that you can survive um, as if you want to be a public person or want to be an influencer positively what is, what is your take on uh, on authenticity and how to become well, you've got to accept yourself mm. before you can be authentic. Um, you know, you've got to accept um, all your own issues. You you haven't got to clear them, um, but you've got to accept yourself. If you can accept yourself, um, then you can be authentic. But if you can't, then you're going to be lying about who you are, who you think you are, yeah. and how you live because you, you're going to be operating uh, against how you think you should be and how you know you aren't, mm -hmm. if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, there's a danger with, especially social media, where, like what are people putting on their social media? It's a world that they want others to think their world is, right? Um, I think social media, again, is brilliant for uh, sharing this kind of uh, information. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. It, it's brilliant yeah. for this kind of information, but I resisted it for a long time. Um, and, uh, but I've learned that it is, it's very good. But mm. I think also there's, there's a lot of rubbish and, you know, uh, you find social media people, you know, posting pictures of themselves, falling about drunk and, you know, and this mm. is, this is having a good time. Well, is it having a good time? You know. Well, in, in that in that level of perception and consciousness, you know, there at that moment, it is. I mean, yeah, it is. But it know. but it also demonstrates the level of consciousness. So you know, you can look at it mm. from that perspective and say, this is demonstrating the a level of consciousness that we all look at and we go, you know, that's that's stupid. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, and you know, the more that's revealed. 
um, the more it will be, uh, you know, people might decide they don't want to be like that. Not, not only don't they want to be photographed like that, yeah. they don't actually want to be like it. Yeah, I had a funny moment where I was um, uh, cleaning up old stuff and I found, it, you know, these cameras where you had to like switch through, uh, like these carton boxes, like mm -hmm. throwaway oh, yeah. cameras. Yeah, yeah, I remember those. And yeah. I found one which was undeveloped and I, and I recognized it like, ah, this is from a holiday from like 15 years ago. Burn it. I was just like, throw it away. <laughs> because, you know, I was doing other stuff in, uh, where was it, like sp southern Spain as a young kid, yeah. just drinking and, uh, yeah. Well, that's a good involvement. All right, we have to close it down. I'm going to ask you one last question. And um, what is the main skill that people should learn um, to um, to have an advantage in the coming future? Um, well, I don't people think people should do anything. Mm. I think, um, you know, telling people they should do something is straight away telling them that they're not good enough. And... What I think people need to realize is that uh, everyone is good enough. Everyone deserves love. And um, people that are struggling are people that are in pain. And to look at the world compassionately mm. from the perspective of, you know, there are no difficult people in the world, only people in difficulty. Yeah, that's powerful, beautiful. Uh, and a great way to uh, to end this um, this recording. Uh, where can people find you online? Well, they can find me online at uh, www.altazarrossiter.com. And uh, it's a website that's uh, a work in progress mm -hmm. and uh, not always up to date. I do my best to keep it up to date, um, but it's not always. Um, they can find me on Facebook. Um just uh, search for Altazar Rossiter on Facebook and that's probably as good a way of uh, finding me and they can find me through uh, Bridgman yeah uh, so do you have any events or workshops coming up we do we have uh, we're starting tomorrow we're starting uh, a, a training program a facilitator empowerment training program uh, for this year and uh, we have some uh, one day workshops uh, also scheduled later in the year but um, I think uh 14th of April is one, 2nd of June is another, and we will be uh, scheduling some more. But those are, those are the two at the moment. Right. Uh, the training is full, so we, we have a, a a big group for that, and that's, that's full. Yeah, so the people can sign up for next year. Then. They can sign up for next year. Right. Thank you for uh, coming to the studio. I really enjoyed it. And uh, whenever yeah. you're back in Holland, you're welcome to... Uh, Well, I think uh, we've discussed a little bit of your book now, but uh, yeah, we can do a little bit more. Yeah, we could talk for a long time. All right. Thank you for coming. And okay. listeners, thank you for listening. Thank you.